Yes. If you want to really go places in this life, you need to leave land and get on these little watercraft. And they're not, you know, a few hundred bucks and you've got a 2.8 pound pack raft. I've even had a pack raft down in the Caribbean islands on one of those fly fish journal missions down there and was paddling out and sticking cuda out of a little pack raft. And so I would encourage anybody that's listening to this to figure out where, get on, get on the local classifieds, find your canoe, find your drift boat. You've got, if you get watercraft, you can go places. That was River Horse Nakadate giving us his best DIY fly fishing tip. Do you have a go-to watercraft? This is episode number 79 of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Today's episode is sponsored by the Wet Fly Swing Member Society. The society provides exclusive discounts and access to innovative products and services from our member partner companies. Just head over to wetflyswing.com slash members to check out some of the companies who are on board. Plus, you can support the show at one convenient location. In today's episode, I talk uh, with River Horse Nakadate, who has been sharing his fly fishing stories of bass, redfish, travel, and love for many years. River Horse describes southern Texas largemouth, uh, largemouth bass fishing, redfish, and chasing fish in a canoe. We find out how he has laid a life as a writer in surfing, music, and fly fishing, all while keeping deep connection to Mother Earth. Don't miss this one as River Horse tells us a few stories about his connection with Willie Nelson and Stevie Ray Vaughan's voodoo child. So, without further ado, here's River Horse Nakadate. How's it going, River Horse? Not too bad. It's a nice winter day down here in Texas. You know, it's in the 70s. It's oh, a tough life. Damn, that's right. Yeah, I heard there was a, a cold snap going around the country, but I guess it doesn't affect Texas, huh? No, not not like what you guys have. Is there snow up there or something? Yeah, yeah, we're um yeah, I mean, I heard just a couple hours away they had 2 feet of snow, which is kind of crazy. So, we're definitely in the snow zone. Cool. I've I've read about it in books and seen it in the movies. So I don't know what it looks. Like. <laughs> I know. That's the thing about uh, Texas, you hear all sorts of, you know, there's definitely the good and the bad of of Texas, but definitely the weather is one thing that's nice. I'm kidding. Yeah, I love it up there too. So. Yeah, well, we can yeah. talk about that. Yeah, yeah, we'll get into it. So I was gonna dig into a bunch. Uh, well, I mean, I guess maybe we can just bring it back. Um, you know, I ran into you through the Fly Fish Journal, listening to you know and reading about some of the stuff you've done there. That's first where I, I connected. You know, heard about you and all that. Um, and you know, and once I got into, it, I realized you've you've written a lot and you've done a lot <coughs> of diverse things. You know, in and out of fly fishing, but. I want to get into all of that, but maybe you can just talk about before we get going how you you know started in fly fishing and how that all came to be. I mean, it's a cool story. I had this beautiful, unconditionally loving uh, Cherokee Scotch Irish single mom, and and I was born down in Texas in Austin, and she was going to college there, UT, and so um, we had you know I was born in. Started to grow up in the river, the Colorado River actually came through the backyard or where the student housing was, this government housing. So right there is kind of the chrysalis of me jumping in the river and figuring out how to nail bass on a Zebco. And you, you've got that and some great memories there. Plus it's Texas back in the day. And um, a few years in, just, you know, early elementary school, she fell in love with this guy who was from Portland who was actually a PhD uh, English literature graduate from Stanford and had come to UT Austin to teach. And the guy's a steelheader and they've got a house on the coast of Oregon. So this guy comes into my life and just becomes this amazing father that I hadn't had. And we're cruising every week, uh, summer, we're cruising up to Oregon and living on the coast all summer. And so there I'm fishing, I figure out surfing and even in elementary school, this guy had me reading Chekhov and all kinds of Russian authors and great literature. So he kind of groomed me. And, you know, if you look at who I became now, you've got all the water and the adventures and the literature and, and nothing really changed. So I would say that was the foundation of that. But 
Um, so the fly fishing, you know, it just takes over your soul. And once you find that as a path, I, I think it's kind of all over. I just can't imagine not having that in a life. And I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about. But. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I ran into you recently at the um, one of the readings of uh, the writers on the fly and um and you're reading there and yeah i mean you had a, a room full of you know fly fishermen and women going to listen to basically poetry um so yeah there's you know it's it's pretty people are, they have the passion i you know you mentioned your so your this was kind of like your stepdad or was your mom's boyfriend or it wasn't actually well, your, yeah so she married him and and you know and he became my father oh, wow. so you know he's the father that i know and love and um we're just, we're, I mean, to this day, we, we call each other every couple of days and he comes wow. to visit. And That's amazing. It was just a gift to have those two cool parents. You know, he came along a little, little later down the road, but what are the odds that I get this literature professor who's a steelheading flesh fisher from Oregon? It's crazy. I mean, it's just, it was just meant to be, so. Yeah. No, it, it, yeah. It, and I took that even, you know, I couldn't stop reading books and I couldn't stop with uh, Wanderlust, even as a little kid, I was just gone, and they let me run wild as could be and encouraged it, and <clears throat> I would go, it just didn't matter, like I was gone, but um, I'd go on these tangents just in the outdoors and rivers and fishing, and definitely they just let me explore that whole Pacific coast and climb mountains, even as a kid, so solo, like all alone, but I started started writing in high school um sent a couple poems away and they got published and i had never wanted to write about fishing i just thought i'd keep that really private but um got really heavy into the surf world and and became an assignment writer for surfing magazine for a decade and wrote a bunch of cool adventure and prose pieces and same with the guitar world and playing in bands and writing for them and Finally, I think it was, shoot, Ben Romans was the editor. I think it's been about eight years since my first piece in Fly Fish Journal. But, um, you know, when I found that magazine, I just said, all right, that's it. This is the bar. And that's pretty much <clears throat> what I've tried to do with my life is to find the things that have the highest, absolute, most beautiful emotional content and quality. And, um, that's what I felt when I found that magazine. So I've written so much for those guys and had so many, so many good times and, and they've really become family. So you know how this, I don't know how to explain it to people, but the people who know that are in fly fishing know that it is the tiniest, uh, wonderful world. Like once you're in it, it just feels like everybody pulls tight and takes care of each other. Mm. So That's great. Yeah, that's the... <laughs> That's the world I'm kind of, uh, you know, have gotten into the last year. Um, and I, you know, I've do a new episode every week and I was just editing and listening to one I did with the Oliver White and he was explaining about, you know, you know, just that same thing about how, you know, you gotta, to, to be in it, you gotta kind of have that passion. And once you get in, you can just have that community. So yeah, it's cool. It's cool to hear. Um, I did want to take it back. You mentioned, you know, just to touch base more on, on your folks, you mentioned, you know, obviously you're your dad, who's, you know, basically your dad that raised you, your biological father, was he, did, was he gone at an earlier age or what, what, what happened there? Never on the scene, but, uh, you know, I met him when I was 19 or so and just a fascinating, awesome guy. And I spent, um, three or four times I get to hang out with him and just had a blast. You know, I'm not that, I'm not that person that holds grudges sure. or I, I know we're all doing the best we can in life. And, you know, I'm a really gentle, loving soul because of how my mom brought me up. And, um, you know, to meet him, finally, we, we had a lot of good times. But I didn't, I wasn't lacking for a uh, love or a father at that point. But he spoke seven languages. <laughs> he was a flamenco guitarist, a pro motorcycle racer. Wow. And I was like, well, <laughs> that was, of course, of course, when we got together, we just had a blast. And, you know, but I was... And uh, the, some people like that, some people like that are, that's your path. And he was one of those shooting stars like a comet. And he lost his life early on, you know, a little after I met him. And I just thought, what the heck? Oh, like, wow. wow, that was, that okay. was crazy. That is crazy. Okay. 
you know this movie that I actually haven't seen, but I've I've heard about. Can you explain? Uh, I guess it's um, the love and water uh, and the, how how that all came to be and what that's about. Sure, I mean Patagonia. Uh, I've loved working with those guys, and they've been so supportive of a lot of artists and so much of my work anymore. Everything I want to do is just to celebrate the earth and protect it and really big into environmentalism and so those guys and flyfish journal they've given a uh, flyfish journal a lot of support and same with yakima and some others but um they wanted to do these films and I, i'm sure that you know, nobody's doing any southern texas pieces and they had wanted to do it for a year or so and finally i, I got the time to do it and um it's so cool for me to be able to narrate and write and play music and show everybody my backyard they just followed me through it and it was this more so it was a texas love poem you know about these places and i think um of all the people that got to see that um everybody's just been so stunned at the raw beauty of it and and i you know i mean you've seen my writing and i'm always gonna talk about these places with my heart on a sleeve just really honestly and and to the bone, you know, how they matter to me. So you, you pop that up, and I'm sure it'll be a gorgeous eight minutes for you. And <laughs> you'll, uh, you'll call me right back and ask <laughs> if you can come, come down here and get some bass. And nice. Hit the road. nice. So, so where now, Southern Texas, can you clarify? You don't have to tell any secrets, but is there a, a major home river out in that area that people might, might know of or have heard about? Well, I mean, so as far as the in the near Austin, there's the Hill Country, and there's seven gorgeous emerald spring-fed rivers that are in these canyons with limestone and bluffs. And people don't go; they have no idea how amazing these systems are. But Texas is the size of Spain, so you've got to, you know, you got to do your work to get out there and and set up how you're going to camp and get through there, but there's fish everywhere. So you've got those river systems that I really cherish. Um, even that river, the Colorado that comes through Austin just has gorgeous large mouth on it, just buck buckets and river bass are so strong and have so much heart. But then I love the Piney Woods Lost Lakes in East Texas, and you'll see those in the film. And then on the coast, a lot of those I do with the canoe, and then down here on the coast, I'll canoe into Louisiana border marshes or near Galveston, those those systems. And I've got a, a sweet uh, flat skiff that I take out there too. But um, I love the the green power of my shoulders taking me those places in the canoe. So don't use the skiff as much as I could because there's something so sensual and personal about being in those the, those waters with the canoe with your hips like right down in it but galveston that whole system and we've got 300 miles of barrier islands and marshes that are fairly uninhabited and you know you get in those flats and there's nobody there nobody's going to be able to navigate or get into those waters let alone there's some places where you can really lose yourself in, in good ways and other ways you, you better know how to get home and storms can hit. So those would be my primary systems as hill country rivers and then the coastal marshes for reds and the borders and then those um, East Texas lakes. Oh, there's some stalker trout over on the Guadalupe and I think that's fun for people, especially that haven't gotten introduced to trout. Um, I don't know if it's a purist thing or what, but I like wild fish, and and I don't go fish that for trout. I don't I don't do that river. So, <laughs> but even even Hillary Hillary Hutchison was down here this weekend, just rocking these big stalkers, and she's got those trout on her Instagram. It's so fun, to, you know. I'm glad because she's an amazing ambassador for everything environment and everything, and I'm sure she had a blast and had some good brisket. But me personally, I'm really I, I just feel differently for me about, you know, okay, I'm not going to chase hatchery fish or that. But if I came through Texas and never gotten to do it, and it was right there where she was giving her speeches, oh, yeah, you know. So I never talk about 
the trout fishery here, but you know, all respect to Trout Unlimited and the great work they're doing. And they they bring some huge rainbows and browns. To, I mean, of course, it's Texans. Texans are going to bring these giant stock of trout and throw them in this Bass River. So <laughs> that's right. But yeah, I mean, I, and I've heard the Guadalupe. That yeah, that's definitely a basin you hear a lot about. I didn't even realize it was it was all a big uh, stock fishery was the big the big thing there. But but I guess that makes sense. Um, just for the trout yeah I mean, just for the trout the right wild. yeah they do that in the winter and some some actually make it through their you know holdovers but i don't i don't fish that so just to, to be real clear about that that's not i'm running pretty far on the fringes looking for those wild creatures so and i'm definitely anti-hatchery and and every every sense of the word for Many, many, many reasons. Yeah, no, uh, and yeah. that hatchery, that whole uh, hatchery debate, we, uh, I, you know, just because of, uh, for one reason, I don't have a lot of time to get into a lot about it. I've always tried to hit on, you know, more like the, the stories and the journeys and the tips and things like that. So I, I think we'll focus on that today. And what do you think? Is there, do you know, is there a most popular story you've written, um, whether that's fly fishing or surfing or guitar over the time, or uh, is that something that you even think about? I don't think about it, but it's a great question. And, you know, when we're on those tours, like the tour you got to see that you meet so many people <clears throat> that love the work, and it's fun to hear which pieces resonate with them. I think at this point, my body of work from all those years in the surf world and the guitar stories, and now the fly fishing stuff's gotten, I think I've done almost 20 pieces for Fly Fish Journal. And I think it it's fun. and um, a Southern Wish that Jason Rolfe had me record once, but that's been a piece even Dylan Tomina and many others said that it really meant a lot and, and helped them through some things in life. And that was a piece about my mother um, passing on. <clears throat> At the time, she had passed. And then, uh, and then there were some other things going on, and I had bailed, as usual, just for the uh, marshes just to be alone for thanksgiving and really make sense of life and i feel i think i was eight ten pages and a 8.2 fly fish journal issue i think but people seem to really love that piece and then um you know there's such an ebb and flow to my work i think sometimes i'm really rowdy hell raising and celebrating how fun it is and and not take things too seriously whether it's uh I just did that piece on the bass yoga, getting kicked out of yoga, laughing so hard and wanting to go bass fishing. And, <clears throat> you know, there's things like that or burying a carpenter pitcher's mound or a fight on a jetty or cops, five cop cars escorting me out of a country club during a national golf tournament. Like those pieces are hard for, you know, people just remember those and they laugh and laugh and we need more laughter in the world. But, you know, as far as a really deep piece, I think, uh southern wish hits it um the surf pieces and surfing you know i had surfed all over the world alone for just years just trying to find every spot and sleeping on cliffs and um i would end the issue of surfing magazine with some prose poetry and they'd have a different painter uh paint a uh, picture with each of those pieces that i did and there was a piece called fine-tuned I just talked about the smallest, most beautiful details of life, how, how they can be the most meaningful. And I would say I heard a lot uh, from people about that piece and how essential it was and honest and so nice to see in a, in a surfing magazine, you know, which is the same with fly fishing. Like I think it's our job to step up to the plate and really um, expose our hearts and, and life and what we feel and what we go through in these pieces. So. Those would be a couple. You know, I, I've surfed a little bit in my time, and I think it's it's amazing. It's amazing. Even if you're not even any good, just to be out there in the waves, it's such a, such a uh, I don't even know what the word is for it, getting worked over in a wave and tumbling over and trying to, you know, stand up on the board is just crazy. But, um, you know, when you think about writing, we've talked about this before on the show, how there's just, I don't know what the numbers are. In fact, I think Steve Duda said that, you know, if you combined all the sports together, or something, there still wouldn't be as many as there are fly fishing riders. Um, you know, do you see when you look at surfing, are there a bunch of, I mean, what's the difference between f surfing riders and fly fishing riders? Are there, are there, is there a lot, are there similarities? 
No, I think fly fishing really sets the bar because it's not that surfing doesn't lend itself to the amazing moments and those deeper moments and content, but you know, there's such a small handful of people actually riding well and a tiny niche. I mean, uh, and what if in fly fish journal, maybe eight people in the world will get in there four times a year, I think. So, you know, to, for those people that want to ride and get to those spots and it's really challenging. I just think fly fishing itself lends itself to that meditation and that um, candid introspection. Surfing is more something you're out there feeling it, doing it, and and fly fishing. For some reason, it really gets inside your veins and courses through that blood. And there's a there's another type of meditative interaction going on, especially just that rhythm of casting and working your way. But I think... I think that all those years surfing, I was still writing really sparse, hard-hitting prose poetry even on that. I've kept that style and voice, and I feel that really honed me to the writer where I'm at with these pieces now. So, You know, the event in Portland, uh, you mentioned, I think, something about yeah getting booted out. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that, and, and I don't know if you could tell us what that was all about? Well, I was, you know, I'm just... I feel like the problem with a lot of magazines and a lot of uh, writing is that everybody's recycling the same cliches and themes. And I've never done that. I think if you run full bore, really wild, and go as far as you can to the outer fringes of the world and challenge yourself in life, put your ass online with no one but you to account for, I think it puts you... It just kind of puts you in moments where you're going to have different stories. And I'm open to exploring yoga and reading Siddhartha and um, trying to be open-minded and hearted to everything in this life. And Plus, yoga is so good for you. So I love the, the characters and the, and the juxtaposition of the different types of people in that yoga class and what it does for your body. So I was down there taking class. And for some reason, um, you know, this day in particular, everything just sounded sexy and double entendres. And I'm going to start laughing like anywhere, any something funny, like I'm going to let it loose. I want to laugh and enjoy life, have that unbridled joy. And, and at that point, once I started going, you know, it was, it was gonna, it was gonna happen. And I kept thinking, um, uh, it was going to upset somebody. Anyway, the instructor came over and asked me to find my happy place and visualize it. <laughs> and so, of course, I thought about this perfect bass lake. And then when I was laying on the mat thinking about it, I was like, shit, I could be there right now. And yoga, we were like 15 minutes into the yoga class, and I just stood up and hauled ass. And they're like, where are you going? And I was like, I'm going bass fishing to the happy place. <laughs> and so that's where that piece comes from. And the point is that, yeah, there's so many things in life that you can write that are still fishing stories. Like I'm a, that's a yoga studio fishing story. So I would encourage, yeah, and I would encourage anybody to find those moments in their life, those unexpected times when um, you can still tell these stories and show that reverence for for what we're doing and water and the earth and and have it be unique, have a unique voice and and have a unique you know, life, there's just so much content out there. And, and I don't think, I think only a few people are really coming at it from different angles and tapping into it. And you had mentioned Duda. And I mean, of all these magazines I've written for, and I, that guy is absolutely the most amazing editor and writer and, and such a great soul. And some of my absolute favorite times have been working on a piece with Duda or just going to see him and hang out up where you guys are. So that would be somebody who you know well, and I'm assuming, and that's somebody who walks the walk, and that's somebody who's in that tiny handful of people who are just at, at another level. And I think Patagonia grabbed him up. He's doing fly fishing content there. So, yeah, so whatever he's doing for them, probably they're, they're going to do fly fishing catalog work so whatever he's doing down there i mean just expect it to be badass i'm, I'm sure it's coming i know he and chris gaja who's an awesome supporter of the arts and all we're doing i know they're down there cooking up something 
but yeah, no, this is, this is so cool. And I remember when we looked at, uh, you know, when we were again up in Portland, we heard you, you started talking a little bit about, you were painting this picture as you were reading one of your spots there about how it was like laying, it was almost like, I mean, laying down with you, you're painting this picture, like this love moment. Yeah. Settle down up there, buddy. So that piece, <laughs> you know, you need to come in strong. You, you come in the front door, you don't throw pebbles at the windows or if you want to go somewhere in life, you come in the front door. If you want to write that piece, you get right down to it and just, and go to the action. And I thought, you know, I love, pulling strings of people and there's that dark it was such a cool venue the upstairs of that old bar with wood floors and we're on this vintage stage and it's this cool little neighborhood and um i wanted to right off the bat send a message to everyone that i was here to shake things up and get rowdy and really catch them off guard and that's exactly what uh, it, it probably probably a lot of people thought what the heck Immediately, I clarified as right when I had you guys where I wanted you, I just let rip and titled the piece and, and everybody just let out this big breath like, oh my gosh, that was bizarre. <laughs> you know, I mean, we were talking about this intimate moment, candles lit, laying down together, heavy breathing, it feels so good, it's really hot and everybody's like, what the hell? And then I said, it's time for bass yoga and, and everything became clear and stuff, so. We really need that laughter in this life. It is a fragile, fleeting, intense life out there. If you don't, you know, everybody's trying to find their way. And we definitely need these fun laughters. We need me on a stage at an old theater in Oregon, letting loose with that kind of stuff. And you can tell the pieces that I chose for the reading were just rowdy, fun loving. I'm not trying to bring anybody to tears on those, those tours, you know. No. How do you... You know, you have obviously, you mentioned Cherokee in your blood and, you know, the Native American, uh, you know, uh, history there. I mean, how do you, do you tie into that frequently? Is that something that's always on your mind? And how, and how do you balance that with, you know, all the, the impacts of the history and everything that went on? And even to today, you know, I mean, there's still struggles. I mean, does that all, how, how do you, how do you deal with all that? Or how do you see that? Um, I think it's a really cool uh heritage like part of my makeup when i i did this dna test and my sister made us all do it when my mom and dad ended up having a little girl together and that 23 and me that come anyway i was the wild card since i didn't know my biological father much and mine came back viking native american and you know and she just called me up she got all the results i knew it all you do is run around the ocean you're freaking crazy and we knew you're a viking too and but one thing that's cool is it came back 20, 23% of, I think it's called a hopla or something. I forget. But anyway, 23% came back uh, northern Scandinavian indigenous, which oh, wow. is actually there's the Sami tribe up there. And they have some of that similar gene. So whoever was in my background between the Native American and the the Viking and the indigenous up there, somebody was on the road, like really Roman <laughs> life. And I love that about me, but I don't, I don't, you know, your question, I don't feel, I feel me. Like, I don't feel everybody. I just feel like here I am the product of all that and lucky to be here from, and, but I, I'm real cognizant of that stuff. And I know that my absolute just, hard on the sleeve reverence for mother earth and nature you know i know where that comes from and i know why i know what blood is in these veins and and why i'm so spiritual about taking care of the earth and the environment yeah so. that's it I, I, th I think that's one of the cool things about the um you know about one of the with the native americans that that's you know that whole environmental ethic where you know the the animals were their family and you know and that and that's kind of the struggle with some of the other religious pieces the other religions where you know they don't see it the same right they don't see the as the animals are part of us and i think that's one of the most beautiful things about the whole thing that and that's what you sounds like you see that as well no and that's a big push with me and i agree with that like even that um i've always felt that we're here to love each other and take care of each other and i think mother earth is our one true unconditional lover that's there for everyone if you go out and seek it and so 
Just like whether I'm trying to protect the boundary waters from pit mines with films up there or, you know, that Sami tribe in the Arctic Circle, they've got their reindeer that they've followed for years because of global warming. The lichens are um, being frozen in the ground. And so those reindeer maybe have 20 years of life and that culture and whether it's wetland loss. But I've always, there's never been a time in my life, even as a little ragamuffin where I wasn't crazy for the earth and knew that that was our, you know, my religion anyway. You know, what I thought about where this show would go, I really, you know, didn't have an idea, which is perfect because I think, you know, we can take it wherever we want. But you, can you talk a little bit about maybe a few of the other, if you've had mentors, whether that's in fly fishing or life and, and maybe the, the best advice you were ever given? Well, I think I've found a lot of those mentors in literature. You know, I've got books on my dash. Sometimes I'll be at a stoplight in the truck and I can't help but open some poetry waiting for the light and people are honking all pissed at me because I'm reading poetry. I think a light screen, but um, <clears throat> you know, early on I had found Pablo Neruda's poetry, the Chilean poet that was exiled. And I was just stunned by that stuff and it really shaped me and um, crazy for Whitman and John Muir and you know, Thoreau, and I found these guys so early, and it's the same deal. These people are crazy for poetry and the earth and life, and I would call those guys my mentor. As far as surfing, you know, I'm not going to, we all have our own style on the water, and I never, I would always, on the, you know, I'll be in Africa from Mozambique for three months all the way to Cape of Good Hope solo, or Fiji, and a some military, you know, chasing his ways all over. I didn't care what everybody else was doing. I was more trying to get those feelings to ride a, you know, giant wave in the middle of Fiji alone. And so I didn't, I don't think I had the mentors there, but I know that I know through the hard knocks of life from those road adventures, I think those are my teachers and stuff. I mean, you know, those carjackings and, Gun, gunfire and bad stuff happens out there that I don't even, I don't even want to talk about, <laughs> but it's happened. And then even funny, dangerous stuff like, uh, you know, I went to El Salvador seven times by myself, just crazy for that stretch of Central America. And even one day there's a restaurant there with this enormous art sculpture in it, this little cafe. And you think, what is this art? You know, he asked the guy and he says, oh, that's not art. It's a that's a bomb that came over the mountain during the war, a Jeez. giant rocket bomb, and it came through the wall, and we're afraid to touch it. It's been there for years. And wow. Like, we're, Damn. We're, ordering, we're ordering pupusas next to a giant bomb? Okay. this is You know, those things you learn out on the road wow. with the people, the people and the culture that are so much more grateful than a lot. You've know, got so much going for us in this awesome country that uh, hopefully people go out there and do things that, allow them to be grateful for all the people and the good life that we have. That's cool. Yeah. That's so when, yeah, I wouldn't say mentors, but you know, <clears> you know if you're a Texas sure. guitarist, <laughs> yeah, Texas guitarist, you got Billy Gibbons and Stevie Ray and Willie Nelson, all three of which I've gotten to do some hangs. And no play kidding. Guitar. You, you, yeah. you, you've, you've hung with Willie, huh? On the ranch, did a cool piece over there for a fretboard journal. Stevie and I would cross paths. I had his amp for a while. <clears throat> it was a crazy Stevie story where uh, we were held at shotgun with his amp in a Super 8 parking lot in Austin, and that was in a guitar magazine. They told that story. Yeah, crazy, but we got the amp back to everybody and got out of there fine. Um Gibbons has come over to this house, the ZZ Top guy. It's a small, you know, the community yeah. and play guitars. And he likes to go out to these cantinas. And we got out and had some drinks and goofed off a little bit. And so, huh. guitar mentors? Yeah. I mean, how cool is it? That's that amazing. You get yeah. With those guys. Those are, so, those are but, the best. Yeah. Willie and Stevie both. What, what do you think is if you had to pick out their, you know, a favorite song of Stevie's or Willie's? Do you, ha do you have one? Um, I talked to Stevie one time before a show and he said, what did you want to hear? And I said, Hey, let's play some Buddha child, like crank up some Hendrix. And yeah, he didn't, he didn't play it. He came off the stage and I kind of thought, wow, that's weird. And then he came back on the stage and did it for 45 minutes oh. for an encore with two wah-wah pedals, 
duct taped together with a board so he double wall <laughs> to each other. And I'll never forget when Stevie played that. And uh, he he was something else, I tell you. Yeah, God, that's just, uh, that's really cool. Yeah, I'll put a I'll put a link. I've been doing this, getting some music for for some of my guests, and I've been putting a little video clips or whatever. So I'll throw in a little Stevie Ray, maybe even some Willie, if I can find something good there in in the show notes. Um, no, this is this is cool. I you've uh, yeah, man. The the more we dig into this, I'm sure we could probably just start pulling out all sorts of crazy stories. Um, I, no, <laughs> they're there. <laughs> they're there. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't say I had any fly fishing mentors. Yeah. And to, you know, to answer the question for that, and the, um, a guy, Jared Malone on the coast here who guided and grew up and a uh, really close friend of mine, that guy is, is magic on the water. He's the closest thing to O'Keefe of all the people I've been on the water with. And, you know, O'Keefe's that, Brian O'Keefe's that other realm. And I've had so many cool adventures with O'Keefe and um, that you know, O'Keefe to me is a cornerstone of fly fishing. Just grace under pressure, beauty, amazing wisdom has just gone to, you know, I'm fascinated with people who have gone as far as they can around this earth to see everything and explore and test themselves. And that's O'Keefe. And you always hear about Lefty, which is great and all this, but I still think O'Keefe should be on a pedestal which you would loathe hearing but you know he's over near you guys in bend and that guy's the guy what would you recommend if somebody's never done it before and they want to start traveling a bit for sure so i'm not going to give up even i mean my whole life's been diy Mm -hmm. but i'm not going to give up these spots no no, not the spots i believe we should all you know guide ourselves in this lesson do it or, or do justice to, to having to challenge ourselves. And, and then it's even sweeter when you get there. But I can tell you this, water, if you find, you should have some sort of, everyone should have some sort of awesome watercraft in their life. They've got amazing inflatable pack rafts. They've got paddle boards. I take that canoe all over the world. You've got skiffs. If you want to really go places in this life, you need to leave land and get on these little watercraft and they're not you know a few hundred bucks and you've got a 2.8 pound pack raft i've even had a pack raft down in the caribbean islands on one of those fly fish journal missions down there and was paddling out and sticking cuda out of a little pack raft and so i would encourage anybody that's listening to this to figure out where get on get on the local classifieds find your canoe find your drift boat you've got if you get watercraft you can go places even if you have a tiny car you can put soft racks on it for 25 bucks and go it will set you set you free if you want a diy it will set you free plus you'll earn it you know the canoe the one that if you had to take just one is that the one you would you'd stick with Absolutely. And you'll see it when you see that fly fish journal film love and water you'll see that canoe just in gorgeous gorgeous places and i talk about it in there like there's a line in there where i say we should all be able to shoulder our most beloved possessions in this life whether that's the person that you love you know or your canoe you should take these things in your arms you should be able to carry these things with you and that's how i feel about that canoe i mean i've had it it's in that boundary waters film we're working on and pretty pretty special so definitely i would vote for that you know, obviously you, you've gotten into fly fishing, you know, you've been doing it a while, but where there was a turning point where you kind of either kind of went into, you know, some part of your life or, or have, have you always been since the beginning, just knew where you were headed? Um, I, you know, I just think I've had this wanderlust and water love from the get go. And I just think it never changed. There wasn't some giant epiphany. There wasn't an epiphany in it. The path just kept going down that same road between that water and and literature and love so no i just i just feel like i was wired for this earth to just go like this Mm. i can't explain it but i feel so blessed all the things the friends have made and all the things i've gotten to do i would not be upset if like i was out of here today and something happened to truck ran me over yeah. something i would laugh I'd say yeah i get it I, wow. I had i had a hundred lifetimes here already I had that's too so much cool. fun i get it i don't want that i'm mean, so yeah. young and strong still <laughs> yeah. and yeah. i'm still running eight miles and paddling and climbing mountains and i think 
You know, if you eat really clean and run hard, your body, your body wants to move. If I have something I'm going through or a tough time or losing a loved one, like I want to attach myself to those emotions and grieve or feel it or feel that joy. The smallest mm -hmm. moments and details having the most beauty. And that comes down to being present, being here now. I don't care if you're, maybe you got to go to the grocery store or whatever you're doing, you can still have you know, an awake moment when you're, when you're doing that, appreciating all this food that you can mm -hmm. look through and the fruit and the fruit that's come from all over the world. Or, so, but sim I mean, that's even Chenard and Patty, that's the mm -hmm. same thing. Just simplify. He, how many clothing companies care about the earth so much and put out a message, don't buy clothes that you don't need and let us duct tape it for you. I mean, that's just says it all. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow, and yeah. that, there's people in our fly fishing community and our industry that we all understand that and get it. So, you know, when you, we talked about your some of the rivers and home waters over there in, in South Texas, you know, can you talk a little bit about you know some if we talk about bass? We haven't talked much about bass here, but I mean, that's I guess you could consider that kind of a destination fishery. Some of these areas, can you talk a little bit about how what that's all like if you've never fished for bass before and and how you get into fish down there? Absolutely. So there's a beauty in trout, like what jewels trout are and how they look and shimmer and how finicky and match the hatch and all that cute stuff. And then you've got bass to me, which is pure Americana, just this rowdy, rude predator, badass, you know, NASCAR driving kind of fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, and they want to play, they want to fight, they want to eat. And I, I mean, I have styles that I like. I've pretty much only fished for bass with huge topwater frogs and mice and just big, loud, rude, wild, raucous uh, ways to approach them. And these bass respond to those huge flies. Just there's so many big fish because it's warm year round. And even that fly fish journal film, you'll see just a, a hog on a on a tree limb eat this frog and you'll hear me howling and catch it you'll see it in that film but that happens all the time and so those fish they're just to me they represent america and all the spirit and the heart of all these people that that founded this country and all the things that they've been through for better and worse with all the mistakes that we've all made <laughs> together but that to me bass and then on a fly rod here you got this this instrument this tool where you feel that fish in your hands while you're playing it while you're fighting it you're so connected compared to conventional tackle so that fish on a fly ride with topwater eats for me like i i just there'll never be a day where i won't wake up and think oh well, that'd be nice let's go totally you know? yeah yeah so so you're out there and I mean, what is the top? Do you, do, what is a good topwater fly you use? What's it? What's that look like? Is that just look like a big uh, deer hair bug, a big giant thing out there? Yeah, two uh, the umqua makes those giant swim frogs, those diving and swim frogs. That's a great fly. Rainey's even has this one called the booby frog. That sounds mm -hmm. so. I don't know how they named it, but it's this the way it hits the water and it looks super realistic. And there's a Georgia bullfrog and. So I'm throwing frogs and mice. Wow. There's one other fly that looks like a drunken bait fish trying to get home sideways, mm -hmm. like drunk driving, and it's called the Dixie Wiggler. Nice, <laughs> nice. And that fly, that fly is like you know George Jones, the country star, trying yep. to drive home from a bar. That's right, that's right. <laughs> and you strip it really slow, and that is for serious fish. The hooks even sideways. The, oh wow! You know, you'll you'll take it right over these lily pads and. You almost get a stomach ache. You're like, oh, no, here we go. It's about to <laughs> It shouldn't be legal, some of these flies. It's so fun. That is cool. Well, that's the cool thing. Yeah, the, the idea there being that the fish, yeah, they want to, they would rather take down a wounded fish than they would a nice, healthy uh, pre, uh, prey item. So that, that's, uh, that's cool. So now when you get into, so if you're talking top water, I mean, how far, so, and we're talking largemouth bass here? Absolutely. Yeah, so we're talking largemouth and, uh, and, so what, so take us to that moment where you're out there. I mean, how does it go down from you, you're on the water and to the fish taking? What, 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 take us to that, what that feels like and how you do it. So with the canoe that you know, I stand up paddle, so I slowly put the paddle down or I've set up a drift and I 
You don't have to back cast much. A lot of these, I'm taking a, a sweet, tight 30 foot shot. I'm looking for structure or a drop off. Something seedy, something greasy, but I want that frog to smack right on the edge of the bank, right on the mud, right on that lip of water, and then just flail its way with just loud, rude, just really push awake, move some water. But those bass hold tight to that structure. You're not going to, if I've stripped that thing more than three or four times, I will pick up and recast five feet further and, and look for that next fish. It is going to, huh. when that fly hits, typically it. it's going to go down really quickly. And I'm just, you know, it's just hammering those banks, even rivers. It's so fun to side cast under structure, mm -hmm. logs and stuff. So I mean, that's pretty much the, uh, the all there is to it. Other than you have to strip set, you've got a massive fly, a fish with a big mouth, you cannot trout set these yeah. fish. You got to stay low, strip set hard, and then keep tight. Huh. That's that sounds amazing. Yeah, I've I've done some bass fishing, but never really got into the any of that top water stuff. So that's I mean that's definitely a destination. <laughs> Something you know we all need to check out if you haven't done it right. It's heart stopping and just it's pure comedy and it's like a horror movie all in one and beautiful too wow <laughs> so but i've got a rule where if you trot set when i'm running out for bass you gotta buy the beer <laughs> yeah that's right a couple of uh uh sentences i'd like you to finish if, if you can i'll just start the sentence and you can finish it um and this sounds like this this sounds like it's some in-depth collegiate no, like academic <laughs> no not all not all actually i stole this one uh uh, I stole this one from Oprah. So if anybody wants to check out oh Oprah. Oh my god. I know I'm I'm sure pretty is... I, I'll, I'll I'll admit it now. I'm I'm a little bit uh you know uh, of of an Oprah fan. <laughs> no, I but I I'm not, I didn't say I wasn't an Oprah fan. I used to surf in front of her house in Florida. No kidding. <laughs> wow. No, well, I will say that this is new territory for me being on a on a awesome podcast answering or finishing Oprah's sentence. Exactly. Well, this, I'll, I'll make Oprah actually said this one, but the concept came from there. But uh, so, uh, so the sentence is fly fishing needs and then finish that sentence. I think it needs more women. I'm so tired. I'm not a fan of machismo. I'm a fan of strength and grace, but I'm not a fan of, you know, patriarchal male, male driven type. Stuff that we've had in the past, I love seeing all these incredible women, even the rowdy ones, mm -hmm. especially, and the gentle ones. I love all these women coming in. I think fly fishing is evolving so beautifully, thanks to these guys. So, my my greatest joy is. I just think waking up every day and knowing how beautiful this earth is out there. I'm crazy for it, and I think it's such a gift. I don't know. I don't think I'll ever wake up and not be excited for what's ahead and knowing what's out there. Yep. How do you, how do you keep it? Uh, how do you keep it great? Or what, what's your, how do you think we can, we can keep it great? Well, I think the way you treat other people in life, if you go out, I mean, I'm one of those guys that's here to tell everybody I know and care about how much I love them and celebrate them. And I feel that that always comes back to you. So that's how I'm going to live my life. And it's worked so far for sure. Nice. What are, um, what are you most proud of? Well, I'm, I'm really thankful for being able to even write these words and tell my stories. It's always, you know, here you write this piece and you're journaling, you got your journal out on some mountain or who knows where you are along some coastal range and you write the story and you work on it and get those words where you know they're perfect and then you send it in and it goes all over the world. And that is fascinating to me. You know, to walk into Barnes and Noble, I think I've got two or three pieces out. I've got three pieces out on the shelves of bookstores all over the world right now, just this month. And that's just like, wow, is this how... How was I leaning against a cliff writing this piece? And now there's people, you know, that, and that's why it was so cool to get to see you and meet you guys on the tour where you, you know, to hear about these pieces or when people message you on Instagram and say, oh, this is, and they, it's, it's really, so I just think that's amazing to be able to, I'm really proud of the heart and the work that I poured into this writing with absolute just, open my soul and, and write honestly and 
turn that loose in the world. I'm really proud of doing that work, but I'm more so just enthralled and fascinated with how it was accepted, you know, and how it just went out there to the world. I think I was pretty blessed. Yeah, no, it is amazing stuff to think that stuff you you write. I mean, you talked about some pretty big writers that were, you know, influences for you. I mean, your stuff, you know, could be out there for, you know, hundred, <laughs> you know, a long time too and, and impacting people. So that, that that right there for writing is is, is a pretty amazing thought, right? That, that that you know, two hundred years from now, somebody might be reading your stuff and and talking about what you did. That'd be fun. It's it's crazy to think about that stuff. You know, C.S. Lewis once said, "We write to know that we're not alone." And I feel like so much of my writing is me just making sense of my life, my place here, and what matters to me, and where I want to go. And if anybody can take that from those pieces that I've done and find that for themselves, that that's really heartwarming to me. Mm-hmm. I guess we're talking about bass. So could you talk, uh, maybe start, off, start us off with your top two flies? Maybe you've already mentioned them before. Sure. Big old deer hair frog and then that Dixie wiggler. Um, well, we didn't even talk about red fishing, and oh. I do that so much on the coast. I'm, I've got that in the film, and I oh, chase yeah. redfish all the time, and they're yeah. a gorgeous, amazing fish. I've chased redfish alone for years out of the skiff, but mostly the canoe, and paddling deep into these twisting, gorgeous marshes with spartina grass and wild herons and cranes. So where those redfish are is you're going to find raw beauty and a lot of times I'll sleep out there in the canoe no under kidding. the stars, but absolutely. And these redfish will, they will tail. They're really great eaters. They've got attitude. They show their emotions. They're, they've got spots on their tails. They're, the back of their tails can have this luminescent turquoise that just buckles you at the knees. It's so beautiful. And they're, when you're in there, you know, those marshes, you can smell them and taste them and feel them and, those redfish, you know, that moment, that sight casting moment when you've worked away silently in a canoe into their environment, their ecosystem, and you know you're just going to throw that little crab pattern right there and it's going to go down. And then when they do make that eat and you sat there in a half a foot of water, so as they swim away, there's this beautiful arc of droplets of water going into the sky and the sun shining through that. And the, those moments with redfish, you know, between that and bass, I just, and I, each day it's like, which one do you want? And I kind of go back and forth with that. But I can't even, I've had a million hours out there alone in those marshes, just uh-huh. full of joy. Are you kind of, I mean, you are you a loner? Do you have, a, what? what is, I mean, is family, is that something as far as your own family, something you've, you've thought about or dug into? I, I don't even know your whole background there. No, that's a fun question. That's a really good question. I'm the opposite of a loner, but I really love challenging myself. And so I don't know a lot of people who want to run that far, like who wants to wake up in the dirt in Mozambique. And I don't know. I haven't had a lot of people run those places with me, and I've been able to set up my life doing that. So um, I'm definitely not a loner. I love being around all these people that matter so much to me, but I really think that having that balance of running wild and then being back around people makes you appreciate it even more. The stalker thing was bizarre. Um, I've been in bands and done readings and different things, and there just happened to be a couple girls along the way that uh, just, I don't know what it was, but just for I didn't know them and never met them, but they had known me and had to get the police involved and just take care of it. And I feel bad for them, but I just can't. You know, I'm really, I'm private in some ways. I want to let the work do the talking and I keep a really small handful of cherished friends. But I think I'm not, I've never done Facebook or any of that stuff. I think either reading my work or Instagram is the closest you'll get, but then again, I'm one of those people, if I see you anywhere, anybody, I'll, I'll want to talk to you or try to give you a hand or, or say hey. So I'm definitely not a loner. I'm a huge fan of my time with people, but I don't feel alone when I'm with the earth. I don't feel. Sometimes there can be moments like, God, you think, shit, I just got to be so great to share this campfire with somebody. Or I would love to have a soulmate. And I've had some a couple great relationships here and there that were really 
great lessons for me, but um, I mean, ultimately I feel the best form of us is with somebody and partnering somebody. I just, like I said about quality, I refuse to just date somebody where I'm not crazy head over heels for them. Yep. So I'm a snob and that I, and I'm not gonna, I don't do the online and all that stuff and I'm right. always at the top of a mountain or something. So I believe in the path. And, but I do think that's the absolute best version of us, that perfect hand to hold and partnering somebody like, yeah. yes, I live for that. And I, I would love to see that someday, but you know, definitely not a loner. That's cool. No, no, I, I, it's good to hear you talk about that because, uh, you know, it just shows you, you've, like you said before, you could, you could die today and be okay. I mean, it just shows you that, um, you know, you don't have to necessarily have another person there to, to fulfill, you know, be fulfilled or whatever. I mean, I think a lot of people do choose somebody and it's probably not the right person and, and you just kind of, you know, you just live with it or go with it. And, you know, you might even have kids and, you know, all that stuff, but that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that's the, the right way to go. Um, so no, I, I appreciate your, uh, that, that's a, a cool perspective on it. Do do a super quick rapid round. Um, you've been mentioning, you know, you've written for the guitar magazines and bands. Can you talk about maybe a band or two that you've been in and, and mention the name? Um, there was Chrome Soul. I had toured for a while. I've done a lot of uh, independent projects. I got commissioned to do all the music for a world premiere of Houston Ballet. And that was awesome. That was called Shades. Um, I got to play some orchestra with some big orchestras where they'd bring me in to do Hendrix guitar oh, wow. stuff. With, oh, so you were a guitar player? Hilar. Yeah, yeah. It's classic Texas. There's guitars all over this house. So. Um, but yeah, I mean, with the guitar world, I mean, gosh, I've gotten to cross paths with so many great artists and musicians and spend time with them from black crows to almond brothers and wow. you know great great people and i don't even think about all this stuff even a week in new york city that was just unbelievably bizarre with twisted sister working <laughs> on it which is not my yep you know that's not you know i love what, what is twisted and, yeah what is twisted sister is that what would that be what type of music would that be considered i think it's some kind of hard rock that yeah. we're not going to take it anyway <laughs> you know i love like Lucinda Williams and Trevor Hall and this beautiful Celtic stuff. So, but to hang with these creative souls is, uh, I mean, I had so many blasts with all these artists. So, and you learn a lot. And, and again, it's fun to hear them talk about different stories that you've worked on and ask you questions. <laughs> I'm a coffee crazy. I'm always brewing coffees on propane burners and titanium, small French presses. And yep. then, if you want to have a beer, and you know, I'm gonna, I'm a Texas boy. It's gonna be Shiner. Shiner, absolutely. What, and what is Shiner? Is that like a um, a, a dark beer? What, I, I don't know that one. Good lord, buddy! I know you, never, you haven't cut bass, haven't cut redfish, haven't drank Shiner. Uh, all I got here's my Oprah question for you: When is Dave <laughs> coming to visit River Horse? I'm coming, man. I mean, you're you're on, you're on top of my list. I mean, I've been talking. What about, are you? <laughs> what are you doing buddy get it watch that little film you're gonna call me a day later <laughs> nice all right man this is, this is good and, and you don't have a, yeah you don't have much to tie you down so you won't have any excuses uh, to, to say no well, Did i'm you... busy i mean i got three films going right now and a bunch of writing oh that's true doing, working uh <laughs> i'm volunteering to take disabled bets fishing for the bar x project i'm i got a reading at a patagonia store coming in austin like uh, if you we will work it out you, you need and I bake cakes too. Wow! So just you, get on down here. You do it all. I, I, I want to. I've said this before on the show, but uh, John Gearock was on. I had him on, and he told this funny story about how one of his readers at a signing book signing came up and and basically asked him what he does with all of his time. Like he's got all this time on, it. and yeah, he basically was kind of chippy that day, and he said, "You know, who do you th who the hell do you think writes the books?" You know, and it was pretty funny, but what his, his, uh, Ed, uh, Angle at the time basically said, he said, Hey, Hey John, that's a compliment. The fact the guy doesn't even realize that, you know, you actually, the time that takes to write the book. So, I mean, I think that's a kind of an anecdote or a little story there, but, um, you know, I mean, it takes a lot of work, right? Writing. Is it, is it a lot of work for you? Oh no. I got to ask that question. Rolf, that's the editor of Fly Fish Journal asked me that question and he was not happy with my answer. I, just, yeah. <laughs> I all I can say is 
when you do all these fun things, take these adventures that I get to do, and you've got these journals, like, I can't wait to put these words in the paper. I mean, I'm almost overflowing with them, and I've never felt, I don't feel writer's block. I feel, I know when I've got a piece that, that wants to be birthed to the world, so it just pours out. I love the craft of editing. You know, I'll sit there for a week with three words before I value words that much, but no, writing is, it is absolute joy for me. That's great. And, and has that been, has that been like that for many, many years? I guess it's worked out. I yeah. just got published right off the bat and it's just, I think, I don't, anyway, I yeah. think I've, I've been in almost 200 magazines now. Crazy. What do you, <laughs> what do you think is, um, what's your superpower? <laughs> I think of love, love yep. and laughter. I think I just. I love on the people in my life. I, yeah. I'm here for that. Can you share one thing nobody knows about you? Uh, good grief. What is left? All these. <laughs> I know we, we've dug into I, it today. Is there, is there anything that, uh, you know, maybe you've written a lot about yourself and, and stuff. I mean, have you told it all? Is it all out there? I think so. I mean, ultimately with me, all you really need to know is that I believe love is all that matters in this life. So, you know, did you ever, didn't you ask sometimes about book recommendations and stuff? Because I've got a few. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. All right. So obviously, if you don't subscribe to Fly Fish Journal, I, I don't even, if you don't, <laughs> Fly Fish Journal is the end all if you love fly fishing. So you got that guy, De La Valdain, wrote a book, uh, kind of a memoir called On the Water. And you can find that used. And he's over in Florida and builds this little bass pond. And, you know, he had fished with, uh, Buffett and McGuane and all those guys in the 60s and Russell Chatham. And so that book's awesome. There's a guy, W.D. Weatherell, W-E-T-H-E-R-E-L-L, that's got all these, I think he's got five books and they're really navel gazing and hurt on his sleeve. I love his work and nobody ever talks about that guy. And I think he's up in the East Coast and great writer. And then if you want to revisit some stuff like I mean, I'm a big fan of monkey wrench act activism, environmentalism yep. right now. And so, you know, nobody talks about desert solitaire, Edward Abbey's much anymore. And I vote for that stuff. You get your hands on that. And then if you want a couple of sensual, beautiful books, you've got The Outermost House uh, by Henry Beston and Sand County Almanac. You find those two. And oh, man. You know, I would love for people to find those just from this awesome podcast. Anything in the next uh, six to 12 months, anything new? You, you mentioned a couple of some movies and stuff. Anything else you haven't talked about here? Oh, there's just so many great adventures. Got Patagonia store readings, got the Boundary Waters film, got an Arctic Circle film coming up, a film in Louisa Wetlands, got the Taking Disabled Vets Fishing. I, I got a, wow. a Toyota truck commercial bass fishing what? coming up. but. Yeah, I got all this guy Tony Check, my the guy I do that all these films and this guy TonyCheck.com, unbelievable. He shot for Lonely Planet, Red Bull, like all these. And I met this guy coming out of the Boundary Waters, and he and I have become the best friends. And he is his photography and filmmaking is amazing. So he and I have teamed up, and we're just we're just running wild oh, trying to save the earth. That's so, so cool. So that guy. Yeah, so man, this projects I gotta look at the calendar. There's just so much so so much uh, to look forward to. Ni Kawa, Ni is river, Kawa is horse, and it's one word. And then Nakadate stands for center of the chest, which is the heart. So very cool name and it and it worked out for my life for sure. Yeah. No, it's it's beautiful and uh yeah, I, I appreciate you coming on here and um you know, obviously we, we dug in and went deep i think obviously on some of the stuff you've done maybe not as much fly fishing as we normally do but i think it all comes down to like you said love and a beautiful life and if if some of us can tie into more of that maybe from your reading maybe from, if people pick up some of your stuff they'll be able to do a little more of that so uh just want to thank you for coming on and sharing yeah and i want to thank you for the work that you're doing i've listened to all your podcasts and you're celebrating and supporting these arts and you're such a huge part of the community and everybody thinks this stuff is easy doing what you do and i really respect it and i'm thankful you're out there wow that's uh 
Man, that, that might be the first uh, guest that's given me goosebumps. That's uh, that's pretty awesome. I, I appreciate the, uh, I say it a lot when I occasionally talk to people, they email me or whatever and say thank me. But um, yeah, hearing that from you, that, that definitely makes my day. So thanks for that. You got it, brother. And you said something about not maybe not enough fly fishing. Do you want to hear a wild ass O'Keefe story about oh, O'Keefe and me? Oh yeah, give me give me the ju- give me a good one. So you know, as I mentioned, O'Keefe is for me he's that cornerstone. Like you had asked about mentors, and he's definitely one. And I had O'Keefe was down here in Texas, and we hadn't crossed paths yet. And um, he was giving a speech at a fly shop, and I ran through there to grab some ice to throw this French wine in the ice because I was hauling ass to the marsh. And he looked at me and this three feet of hair flying and he's like, you're a real horse. And I said, yo, O'Keefe. And he said, you're here for the talk? And I said, no, I'm grabbing some ice for some wine, but I'm going fishing, <laughs> but I'd like to fish with you. And he said, well, when will you be in Oregon? Let me know. And I said, uh, I'll be there next week. And he thought, oh, shit, I have to take this guy fishing. <laughs> yeah. And so he asked the fly shop, he's like, you know, that's real horse. So I'm a little concerned. <laughs> so I, I'm, I get up to Oregon and I had crews. I was cruising through there to do shoots and some other rivers. I'm sleeping in the truck and he calls and it's late at night. And he says, real horse, there's two choices here. Plan A, B, let me know what you want to do. Plan A, I can start a river. You can't say anything about it. You can't wear any clothes that won't be ripped to shreds. You can bring maybe your driver's license, uh, like two liters, some trout flies, a sandwich, some water, a water filter. Be ready to almost drown. You know, we've got a boat through these boulders and this little boat through these rapids. I don't know if we're going to make it. The boat might get smashed to pieces. Then we're going to climb a 500-foot cliff, try to make it across, and we've got to leap down through this canyon. And if we get down there, there's going to be huge bull trout and rainbows. He said, or I could take you to this bass lake. What do you want to do? And I said, <laughs> said, I said, that sounds like a hell of a trip. And he said, oh, by the way, in all of my years, that's the gnarliest heck I've ever done. And I said, I want to do it. <laughs> so nice. we met. He gave me to some GPS location. We met in the middle of some dirt road. I jump in his truck, leave mine, and sure enough, we go into this. We, we're in this tiny boat from the 50s through these huge boiling rapids. And I'm just hanging on, looking at him like, here, I don't know, buddy. Like, here we go. And he, he's going around these boulders, but the boat's got such a tiny motor and there's so much waves coming through oh, that yeah. it takes us an hour to try to navigate through these boulders and the boat's like flipping all around. Anyway, we pull into this tiny little clearing, climb a mountain, and then we got to put our fly rods in our mouth and crawl on this goat trail looking down off the side of this cliff. It's just this little trail on our knees. We crawl on this trail, and I ended up falling through the trees down into this canyon. <laughs> and so pinballed. And sure, my clothes are all ripped up, but O'Keefe makes it down, and we get down there and start rocking bull trout and rainbows and made it out of there and... Uh, to me, that sums up just the magic of Keith. And even that night, uh, we base camp, made it back to his ranch. And at three in the morning, I thought we were being robbed. I heard all this noise. And I thought, oh, man, you know, O'Keefe's probably got some bow and arrow. He's going to kill this robber or something. <laughs> and so I crawled down the stairs and I looked just to see what's going on, who it is. And O'Keefe's down in the kitchen with the headlamp on. And I said, O'Keefe, what are you doing? We'd already survived this big ordeal that we'd done all day. I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, it's three in the morning. Thought I'd get a head start on this. I shot this elk with a bow and arrow, and I've got, I've got some zucchini from the garden, and I thought I'd make us a nice breakfast. And I said, did you even sleep? And he said, oh, yeah, I slept for an hour or two. And O'Keefe's down there with headlamp cooking an elk that he shot for me like at three in the morning. You're so kidding me. And that's there. like, that's the first adventure. I mean, I, ever since then, for these years, I've done so many adventures with him. It's the same thing. It's just oh, you that's know, so cool. great friendship. And you got to get him on the show. He's, he's special. Of all the places, O'Keefe used to live in the Caribbean with a tiny little handmade sailboat. Oh, nice. You know, living under tarps that's for sweet. months where nobody was on these islands. And you think of all the movies, all the things he's done. If O'Keefe is telling you this is the gnarliest thing I've done in 60 years, do you want to do it? That's it. 
What are you gonna do? Yeah, what are you here? I'm in, I'm um, in for sure. Yeah, that sounds like why fun. are we? That's why we're here on this earth. Like, let's go. Green light. Let's go fishing. So there you go. So much passion. So much love. Cheers, River Horse. Cheers to you, brother. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 79. And I'd love to connect uh, you with some of our member partner companies to help you along your journey. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash members to find out how to get exclusive uh, bonuses and discounts from our member partner companies. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. Looking forward to catching up with you soon and hope to maybe see you on the river or online. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.